Good afternoon. Um, I just want to ask a question, I guess, to start. How many people recall uh, where they were on September 11th, 2001? Okay. Most of us. It's all cemented in their, in their minds. Well, for me, I had just flown from, from Chicago uh, back to Southern California, where I was living at the time. And I get in fairly late. It was around 2 a.m., which was September 10th, and now it's September 11th. Um, so I had no intention of going to work until probably afternoon that day. Uh, yet I awoke to a phone ringing off the hook around 6, 6.15 in the morning. I was told, you know, turn on CNN. You got to check this out. So I started to watch this chaos that was kind of uh, evolving in front of my eyes. And I was told that I had coworkers stranded all around the globe. And nobody really had any knowledge of, of what was happening at the time. Now, I'd like to think that most of you did know where you were and exactly what it was that you were doing. But this is a very emotional time, um, and it's an event that really changed uh, the way we looked at the world. You know, the original accounts were over 10,000 people re reported uh, killed as a result of those attacks. Now, luckily, those numbers have come down uh, significantly to, to under 3,000, but it was still, you know, a huge toll that happened in one single event. Then all of a sudden, the way we looked at air travel has changed you know, forever. Now let me ask you, do you know where you were on September 12th, or the 15th, or November 8th? No? No significance? There was not that one unifying event that really cemented your, your memory. Now, I'm going to share a couple of epidemics that I deal with uh, in my practice, <clears throat> and I just want to, uh, to make you aware of them. So the, the first one really doesn't get the headlines or any press that we see, yet its impact is about 15 times greater than that of the events that happened on September 11th. And what's even more amazing is that these events occur on an annual basis. And it's unbelievable to think that these events are actually classified as preventable deaths. All right, so this epidemic that I'm, I'm speaking about is the notion of, of medical error. Okay, so medical error is defined as the preventable um, adverse effects of care. So this could be things of you know getting the wrong procedure performed, you know, getting the wrong prescription, or the wrong dosage of a particular drug. Maybe you uh, contract an infection up to and including death. Now, according to the Institute of, uh, of Medicine, between 44,000 and 98,000 preventable deaths occur every year in the United States. Now, Kim Vicente, a human factors researcher at the University of Toronto, he, uh, he took that data using the conservative number of 44,000, and he made this analogy. That would be the equivalency of crashing a fully loaded wide-body jet every day or so with absolutely no survivors. Now, if that happened in the airline injury, I industry, that would really shake our confidence. Yet it happens in the healthcare sector every day. 7,000 of these um, preventable deaths were attributed to prescriptions alone, prescription errors. And the other extraordinary tidbit that I, I dig out of this information is that there's one million preventable injuries that occur as a result of medical error. Now this data is the same for New Zealand, Australia, the United Kingdom, Denmark. I'm sure it exists here in Canada as well. So why don't we hear about it? Okay. It's, a, it's an incredible toll on our society, yet it doesn't make the headlines. And I'm not suggesting there's any cover-up or any scandal, but there wasn't that one unifying event that kind of ties all these things together so we remember it like we did the, the events or that occurred on September the 11th. It's not well documented and it's happening all over the healthcare sector, all across the nation. The Institute of Medicine has come out with a statement though, saying that the, the status quo is no longer acceptable and cannot be tolerated. What's even more amazing is that there's another epidemic that exists 
that places an enormous burden on society. And in this particular instance, this is something that I work with on a, on a more of a daily basis as opposed to, to medical error. And that's the condition of chronic pain. Sorry, chronic pain from workplace injuries. Now, you are all aware of heart disease, AIDS, cancer. I think you'd all agree that they make the popular press quite frequently. You know, we've, we've heard stories, you know, there's a lot of us have been touched by someone we know with one of these ailments, either personally or, or through, through acquaintances. But did you know that the costs associated, the healthcare costs associated with these three conditions, coronary heart disease, uh, AIDS, and cancer, if you add them all up, they do not equate to the amount that we spend to treat chronic pain. One more thing. Do you think there's a link between these two? Well, I'd argue there is. And, and the cause is that there's a mismatch. And I, and I would hope that most of my colleagues would agree with me. There's a mismatch in what we're actually asking the humans to do and the jobs or tasks that they're actually performing. So as a good researcher, the very first thing we should look at is to say, what is a human? You know, what makes us so, spe so special? And what are the things that we do that kind of get us into trouble? So if we, we open up our laptop, we get on Wikipedia, we do a little search, and we, we find the Latin translation of homo sapien into a wise or knowing man or person if we want to be politically correct. Um, but what makes us awesome as individuals are basically three things. You know, we have this highly developed brain that allows us to do some amazing things. You know, we're capable of rational thought. We're very good problem solvers. Uh, we have a, a very high degree of self-awareness and we can reason. So we can think about these problems and actually reason them out. The other thing that makes us kind of unique as a, as a primate are these things. They're our opposable thumbs. They allow us to do lots of really neat things like, uh, you know, operate using our fine motor control in a surgical suite. The other thing that makes us kind of unique is that we're a two-legged bipedal uh, primate, capable of locomotion. So we can run, we can walk. We can also get out of our way our own way. We're not down on all fours, so we can lift, carry, push, and pull, and also get out of our way to use these tools. But I have to be honest with you. The reason I get into studying human performance is that I was my own cheat sheet. So if I needed to look at an answer, I could actually poke, prod, or think about things. So it was kind of interesting. Share some examples that all of you experience being human. We all grocery shop at some point during the week. We go, we get our order, you know, we, we go through the checkout, pay for it, load it in our car, and navigate our way home. Once we arrive home, we all do something very similar. We look in our trunk, and we start to kind of make a mental balance of an equal load, because every one of those bags are going into the house in one trip. And we do that because we can, not because we should. The second thing that kind of gets us into trouble is this notion of multitasking. It's a mythical activity. It doesn't exist. Your brain can only handle with one thought at a time. These activities, you know, we pass legislation to ban people from physically touching a phone. We make them you know, wear a headset. That's not the problem. The problem is the cognitive functions that are going on that's really stealing processing capability from our mind and distracting us and, in this case, hitting the skateboarder. You know, there's a lot of studies out there that suggest being distracted while driving or using mobile devices is as equal as being intoxicated while driving. So that's a pretty impressive statement. I could talk about this graph all day long. This is, kind of, this is what centers me in my daily work. Um, may not be special to you, but it's pretty special to me. And it is taking a human-centered or user-centered approach to all problems. So I'm, I'm very much an advocate of that person in the middle. 
And we have to look at all these layers of complexity that we add. We add tasks that they have to perform using equipment and technologies in workspaces that may or may not fit them, environments that are hot, cold, and sterile, and in an organization with lots of different beliefs. Now let's put this into a context of a bad day. You know, for uh, an assembly line worker, a bad day means, you know, I got my hand caught in a machine, maybe I lost a fingernail or an entire digit. For a physician, maybe I operated on the right leg instead of the left leg. So it's not just a bad day for me, it's a bad day for the person that had the wrong limb operated on. And maybe from a teaching standpoint, you assign the wrong grade to a student because you had a, wrong, uh, a bad day. And I would argue that all of those are mismatches in our system that cause those errors to occur. Now, when we look at this, this is a, you know, some people would say it was a bad day for Captain Sully, uh, but he trained his entire life to basically perform what he did in January to save 155 people. And he relied on a system, and we rely on systems as a society to control and minimize the potential problems that are out there. Okay. And it's his system thinking that really saved him. You know, he was able to be calm, 100% professional, cool and collected as he was navigating this aircraft onto the Hudson River. But we have to look at you know, our old ways of thinking. You know, me personally, I have to admit, when I first started in my profession, I used to think that only an expert can solve the complex problems of a, in a workplace. And over the last 15 years, I've been proved wrong time and time again, that the people that actually do the work and do the job have the solutions in their mind and in their head. It's our duty to extract them and actually try and implement them. So in the old model, you know, we'd hire a consultant. This could be me 15 years ago with lots of hair. We'd talk to some users, we'd write up a report, and we'd deliver that report, and that may or may not get implemented. That's the way we used to do things. And I would argue that outside consultants or experts will give you and your organization or your community incremental change. You're not going to get that breakthrough result that we really need, especially where we are today. So I would argue that you know, a new way, and it's, you know, it's new to many, but it's not a new practice, is using this participatory approach of team. And I think the word team gets used far too frequently. You know, people refer to a group as a team, and they're not. They're just a group of individuals. So when they become a team, you know, my definition of a team is this cross-functionality. You know, we take people from all over an organization. They're fully supported by the management group. You know, we know because they're human, they're good problem solvers. They're all experts from whatever area of the facility that they actually come and represent. The synergy that gets created from a team is amazing. And one of the, the techniques that I see people use that are successful is this notion of rapid prototyping or you know, basically implementing solutions as we think of them, trial and error. Because okay, the team is really the transformative um, vehicle in the workplace. You know, so we start out with individuals that come together. They don't know why they're there. They've never worked with some of these folks before. So they are individuals that are grouped. But now we start to exchange some challenging scenarios with them. We give them some education, and they start to trust each other, and they start to rely on each other's expertise. And one of my golden rules when fold, uh, forming a team is actually if there's any negativity or any negative person within the organization that's saying this will never work, I make sure that person's on my team. Because that person's negativity is going to turn into advocacy at some point, and they will be your number one cheerleader when you start to get things rolling. And your, your workforce or your teammates or your coworkers, whoever it may be, they will step up to this challenge. You know, I once had a, a gentleman, I was doing this in uh, Edmonton, Alberta, maintenance worker, very skilled, socially kind of closed, didn't really interface with senior management once, but he really wanted to do this presentation. Uh, so we get up, he was delivering the presentation, and I started to watch his leg do this. And he got halfway through the, con the content, and the legs started to go a little bit further and faster. Um, next thing I knew, he finished, and he darted out the door. Um, he was scared to death. He was very nervous. But he, wanted, he was passionate to get that, that point across. Senior management were amazed at the creativity and, and the innovation that came out of their 
their team. And this person, you know, was a, was a big part of that. And I love teams. I love um, facilitating them because watching them grow and transform like a butterfly is, is very powerful. You know, this is the universal symbol for success whenever I've, you know, worked with any teams. If you get thumbs up, statistically proven, you've done a good job. Um, so I've done this in about 100 companies across North America. You know, and there's some things like increased morale, uh, increased um, acceptance of the solutions. We have increases in productivity, decreases in error, decreases in injuries. So there's been so many benefits I've seen in using this kind of model. So we have to learn as a community, as a workplace, wherever it may be, to tap in to the power of people. Okay? We know people are very good problem solvers. We know that we can think outside the box and abstractly and, and basically hold two, two ideas in balance at the same time. And we can rationalize ideas and alternatives. And what we know is we have to avoid things that we are not good at. We are not good at handling things and lifting and using forces. We're not good at sitting like you guys all are for long periods of time. And we're absolutely horrible multitaskers. It's a mythical activity and we should stop it. We don't have the cognitive capacity to do it. We're not computers. And I, I would argue if we use this approach unilaterally across the, the, uh, the context that I showed earlier of medical error and chronic pain, that we would have some tremendous breakthrough results. So what we have to do now, you know, the data's in. There's 20 years of research and applied case studies that say, you know what, teams are real, really good ways to have breakthrough results, and they're the only real way to effectively you know, drive change. We don't want incremental improvements. We need these breakthrough moments. So on Monday, when you go back to your workplaces, whatever problems are on your plate, you're going to assemble a team, and not your usual suspect, suspects that you, you get your cronies, your yes people. You're going to go and look across your organization and find people from different backgrounds, bring them together, and let them work on the, a project, whatever your problem is. You have to fully support them, remove any barriers, allow them to implement their ideas, and you have to monitor their impact. And I want you to have fun unlocking the power of your people. Thank you. <laughs>